All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, before taking a few of your questions, I'd first like to speak briefly about uh, two Board of Estimates items from today. To discuss the, the first item, I'm glad to be joined by our Health Commissioner, Dr. Lena Wynn, and the Director of the Department of General Services, Steve Sharkey. Now, as many of you know, a key goal of my administration has been to grow our city by 10,000 families over the next decade. And we cannot do that without absolutely ensuring that all of our families have access to quality health care and comprehensive treatment. Our current Eastern Health Center was built in 1939. It's a long time ago. Uh, there have been very few upgrades to that facility since then. Our residents and the center staff deserve a modern, accessible treatment center. That's why with our partners at GBMC, we're moving forward with our intent to purchase 1200 East Fayette Street to replace the existing Eastern Health Center. Not only will the 1200 clinic improve access to quality modern health care, but it is code compliant and it is a culturally welcoming environment for everyone. It will also offer the opportunities for better services and it's estimated to save the city millions of dollars over the long term. I'd like to thank Dr. Wen and Steve Sharkey and everyone at GBMC for their work on this proposal and we're confident that this plan will improve treatment and health outcomes for so many Baltimore residents while representing a bargain deal for taxpayers. I would uh, now like to introduce uh, Dr. Wen, and following Dr. Wen, uh, Steve Sharkey will make uh, remarks to discuss the timeline, accessibility, and the cost. cost. Dr. Wen? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, and thank you for supporting this significant step to improve health for Baltimore's residents. And we also thank the Board of Estimates, and I want to give a huge shout out to Director Sharkey, who has been just a tremendous champion for this, um, for this process. The Baltimore City Health Department is the oldest health department in the country, and since 1793, also a long time ago, we have served the community and we have served as the safety net for those who don't have access to health care, who are uninsured or underinsured. We have two clinics at Druid and at Eastern, and we serve more than 25,000 individuals annually and provide more than 40,000 clinical visits. We provide essential health services at both of our clinics, including immunizations for children, family planning, dental care, STD and HIV care, and tuberculosis and hepatitis treatment. We have top-notch doctors, great nurses, and other healthcare professionals who provide services at the highest standards of care, including specialized services that are not available in other medical facilities in the city. And again, we serve those who are the most vulnerable and the most underserved in our city. Our current Eastern Health Clinic, as our mayor mentioned, has served residents since 1939, but it's outdated by modern healthcare standards and it's difficult to access for our patients with disabilities. In talking with our clients recently, we've heard their complaints and this is what they have told us. This location is very unwelcoming. It feels as if I'm in a prison. The waiting area needs to be updated. The chairs are very uncomfortable and needs cleaning. The clinic is very old. The, lo the location and building are terrible. I have been coming to this location for three years. Please do a building change. So we have this tremendous opportunity for us to upgrade our facilities and deliver the best care possible for our residents. The new building at 1200 East Fayette is a modern space built for modern healthcare. And we look forward to providing the best possible services in the clinical setting that our residents deserve, beginning in spring of 2016. So I'd like to thank again Madam Mayor, the Board of Estimates, and Director Sharkey for their support. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hey everybody, great to see you guys today. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of why I always wanted to be in city government, to do projects like this. Uh, back when I started, as an intern, one of my first jobs was to go around and look at places and take pictures of work to make sure it was done. And I saw the Eastern Health Center, and even back then I thought, we really need to do something about this. The fact that now we're going to get a chance to do something, to take something that's not the greatest and not, not what the, our citizens deserve and make it something great is uh, just really why I've joined city government and why I'm so excited. Um, I'd really like to thank the mayor for her vision and something that nobody notices is that she's increased capital funding over the last couple of years. And even though it's not, you know, it's slight increases over the last couple of years, it's allowed us to put the money down to buy this new center 
So, but even so, we're going to be saving money over the long term because of we're going to be able to put more people or more services in there. And so we'll have cost savings at that center over the long term. Um, so this BOE decision today allows DGS enter, to enter into purchase agreement with GBMC to purchase the property. So these are the final steps here. Uh, the 1200 clinic is going to improve at residence access. It's going to improve uh, bus access, uh, ADA access. It's going to be culturally welcoming. It's going to be much more beautiful. So once the purchase is finalized, we're going to make repairs and we're expecting to open the, open the new center in the spring. Uh, it's going to cost overall total for this center about $5 million to upgrade the Eastern Health or to have a new health center. We're estimating would cost to, or to build a wholly new center of similar uh, capabilities to cost about $10 million. Uh, so overall, this is just an exciting day for health. And I just want to again thank the mayor. I want to thank Dr. Wen. I want to thank the Weinberg Foundation. I want to thank the mayor, the, the, uh, the city real estate office, the planning commission, and all of my employees have been working on this for over a year. So just really think this was a team city effort and uh, I'm just so proud that we were able to get this today. So. Thank you. Any questions about this item? Can we go back to the cost savings mm -hmm. one more time? It was, I'm sorry, it was, it was 10 million to, if you had built a new center? But we estimate it would cost 10 million to build a new center or to upgrade the Eastern is probably even more than that. So these are just conservative estimates using price, you know, standard prices of okay. and uh, by square footage. And that was the purchase Plus Three point renovations. plus renovations. So we're about at one and a half million. Right? About one and a half, probably a little bit, yeah, a little bit more than that. And the time frame between now and then to renovate, we're going to have to do renovations, but we also have to make. It has been so it's only 15 years old, but it's been vacant for about seven. So we're going to have to just kind of spruce it up a little bit. And there's a couple of places in the space that are um, that were never finished that we need to finish, but it's going to be a major upgrade for the residents. Can, can you give the address of the present the health center? Uh, 620 North Carolina. And what kind of uh, um, health um, uh, services are provided there? So the types of services that we provide currently at our 620 North Carolina site, or Eastern Health Center as we call it, we do immunizations for underinsured and uninsured children. We provide STD, tuberculosis, and HIV treatment. We also have a groundbreaking and new hepatitis C treatment um, as well. We also do full reproductive health services and family planning. Um, and in general, I mean, our goal in serving our population is to identify those patients who still fall through the safety net because we are the safety net. You know, people often ask us, um, and not just ask our health department here, but health departments across the country, why do we still need a, a, a health department sponsored um, clinic? You know, isn't the ACA supposed to take care of that? And yet we know that there are still so many people in the city who are underinsured and uninsured across the country and in our clinic. Since the ACA has started, we have not seen a decrease in the number of patients who require services. And so we know that we have amazing doctors, amazing nurses, and we have services that our residents need. That's why we see 40,000 visits a year, which is substantial, and 25,000 unique patients who come to visit our centers. That's why it's so important for us to continue delivering these services. Of course, eventually we want for every single patient to be ideal. If everybody had a primary care doctor that they could call their own, we would love to have all of our services be delivered throughout the city. But we are the safety net for our most vulnerable patients, and they deserve a health center that, um, that is the best face that our city could put forward. Those patient numbers, were those for all centers? Is there a breakout for this center that you can give? That is for our two centers, because that's how we, um, we, we, uh, we, we calculate. But um, we have a, um, so I can give you more specifics, but I think they are for both of our clinics, because we have you know, all of our clinics we calculate together. So it's 25,000 um, unique individuals, 40,000 visits. Um, we have, uh, I'll give you some other numbers as well. We have over 30,000 visits for STD care. 2,000 visits for HIV care, 8,000 for family planning, 1,500 for oral health, which includes dental for children and adults. And our Healthy Teens and Young Adults Clinic uh, sees 1,000 patients. And immunizations, our most recent numbers are that we gave 11,000 doses of immunizations during the last year. And the new center will be able to accommodate even more people? 
We, um, I just visited actually our new center um, the, the other day to take a look at space. We, it, it's a lot more spacious, at least from what I can see, than our, I don't know the square footage and I'm sure um, that Director Sharkey would, but there's a lot more space and the facility is a lot modern. The, the rooms are not crammed. There is, um, it's a much more welcoming feel. And actually we can save further money by relocating some of our staff who are in buildings across the city to the central side as well. So it'll also save us on rent for other facilities um, that, that we currently pay for. Mr. Shaggy, just as a clarification, I'm sorry, what's, what's the total cost for the, the project? What's so it? it's a little bit more than $5 million. Okay. All right. Thank, thank, you. thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now I'd like to discuss another item from BOE from today. I'd like to thank Tiffany Robinson, Assistant Secretary of Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you very much for being here and for your partnership in Baltimore. And I'd also like to thank Ken Strong, our Deputy Housing Commissioner, for joining us to discuss Baltimore's newest Grand Slam, though I won't be talking about the O's Chris Davis, even though I would like to. I would have liked to talk about a win after the uh, Overtime. Is it called overtime? Extra innings. Extra innings. That's the extent of my sports. Now, I knew we lost, that's all I know. <laughs> and it took us extra time to do it. So anyway, I won't be talking about Chris Davis. Anyway, now that I've, um, since I've entered office, uh, my administration has utilized an array of home ownership incentives to help our city to grow. Over the past three years, we've nearly doubled the number of families that we aid with these incentives. Our homestead tax credit carryover is making it easier for families who want to grow within Baltimore, or they want to find ways to stay in Baltimore, to find more attractive options right here, as opposed to moving outside of the city. The Community Development Block Grant Home Ownership Program continues to better enable first-time home buyers to enter the housing market, and the Baltimore Home Ownership Incentive Program, or BHIP as we call it, offers a number of incentives, including our Vegas to Value Booster Program, our Live Near Your Work Incentive, and our City Employees Home Ownership Program. All of these programs are helping, to, uh, helping families realize the dream of home ownership we want this to become a reality uh, for more uh, people in Baltimore. So today, I'm very proud to announce our next step in these efforts. The Grand Slam Home Ownership Program is a collaborative initiative between the City of Baltimore, the State of Maryland, and Baltimore Housing that will help hundreds of, of qualified home, home purchasers, uh, home buyers, excuse me, purchase homes here in Baltimore by the end of the year. Much like the Triple Play Maryland Mortgage Program in uh, Prince George's County, Baltimore's Grand Slam will support incentives uh, offered by MMP, including the state investment of $2 million and a city investment of $1 million towards down payment assistance that will help uh, more people buy homes more easily. But this milestone uh, this is a collaborative milestone that is a unique way in which uh, that combines all of the MMP incentives, which are already successful in our uh, BHIP program, ensuring that more people are able to put their roots down here in Charms, uh, Charm City and strengthening our, our diverse neighborhoods. I want to again thank the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development and Baltimore Housing for their work on this joint initiative. You know, at a time where people say that there's little collaboration between the city and the state, I, I often say that I beg to differ. We have opportunities for collaboration and we have leadership uh, at the state and at the city that's willing to take up that, uh, that opportunity Make it, make it real and make it real for Maryland families. Together we can continue to develop in, innovative policies like this and knock it out of the park, making it easier for our families to buy a home and to grow in Maryland. With that, I want to uh, introduce and thank Assistant Secretary Tiffany Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I want to thank the members of the Board of Estimates for their support of the Grand Slam initiative. This initiative um, demonstrates the governor's commitment to changing Maryland for the better. Um, with his housing and real estate background, he is um, well aware that a strong housing market um, equates to a strong economy. And our department, DHCD, is proud to, pull to, to partner with the city through our very successful Maryland Mortgage Program 
um, to, um, uh, to offer the, the, this incentive to Baltimore homeowners. Um, we uh, have worked in coordination with Ken Strong at Baltimore Housing um, and have had many, many meetings. I love your term that we are knocking this out of the park. Um, we are excited to launch this later. More details will come. We are excited um, and we expect that this program will be just as successful as um, the mayor mentioned our triple play in Prince George's County where we brought 400 home buyers purchasing homes, 87 of those purchasing into Prince George's County in a short few months. So stay tuned for details to come and we look forward to working with the city on this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Assistant Secretary uh, Robinson. This is a great day. Um, we have the um, passage of the Board of Estimates uh, of the city investment in the Grand Slam program, $1 million, which is leveraged with $2 million from the state of Maryland for this exciting uh, initiative. Madam Mayor, it builds on your leadership in growing Baltimore and in expanding the Baltimore Homeownership Incentive program. You increased incentives for city employees. You increased the number of Live Baltimore events uh, that we hold and the success uh, of them. And as, as you mentioned, we have an increasing number of first-time home buyers who would not be homeowners without the incentives that we provide. And so that they're achieving the American dream, which is still uh, home ownership in, in, in Baltimore City. We're so proud of that. Um, and the work that we've done um, over time has been in partnership with the Maryland State Department of, uh, of Housing. We've worked in the past on programs together. We have made state employees eligible for the Live Near Your Work program. Um, we've hosted some events in the past, um, but uh, I want to acknowledge Assistant Secretary Tiffany Robinson, Secretary Ken Holt, and Governor Larry Hogan, because this investment and the work that we're planning, and you'll have more details when we have a kickoff ceremony, we're planning a big event uh, for that, so stay, stay tuned. Um, this will set new records in homeownership incentive program assistance in Baltimore City with the state's help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ready to answer questions about our Grand Slam? Yes. As long as it doesn't lead me to, uh, to any more sports. <laughs> Do we have any estimates of, of, of number of people this might be available to, or what uh, a cash estimate or a dollar amount per person that it might, might translate to? That might be it now. We can get you more specifics. Is that okay? More details will come. We will have a fact sheet and a lot more specifics of um, numbers that we anticipate to serve at our launch event coming in a few weeks. Okay. Well, what was authorized today is a million more in city incentives for... And two million from the state. And two million. But we don't know what kind or how that breaks down or... No, I just, we want to make sure we give you all the detailed information and we can do that in short order. We just, I don't have it right here in front okay. of me. I will say that uh, based on the success of the triple play in Prince George's County, our, our Grand Slam, uh, I think, uh, has the ability to provide even more opportunities for home ownership. And with the ratio uh, that Assistant Secretary uh, Robinson spoke about with new uh, Prince Georgians that uh, moved in as a part of the, the program and the momentum that we've already seen with BHIP and our vacancy value, I know that even more people will take advantage of this program. Um, we have, uh, the, the, there's a great balance with vacancy to value of people that are moving into the city for the first time. There's also a great balance. There's also a, a number of people who are realizing the, the uh, dream of home ownership that, that have been here and want to stay here. Uh, and we want that to continue to happen. Is the state money, uh, was that uh, allocated this year? Do we know the history on that? It was, it was allocated um, from, our, from the state's rainy day fund. Is that part of the 20 million that's going for uh, after the after the unrest? Yes. Okay. And that's why we're very focused on this being, you know, the, these incentives being utilized as soon as possible with uh, the goal of having this out the door by the end of the year. Is there any guess as to how many people could 
see how, how many people will buy homes as a result of this tax credit? And that's what we, when we give the breakdown, we'll be able to give you that number as well. And there's a formal press conference to more details planned for later this year, or? There's a bigger launch event in the works. We needed, this was the milestone, okay. um, getting approval of the city's million dollar contribution. Um, and like I said, more details will come very soon about that event. And then the overall, I mean, do you feel like, I mean, tax credits, tax incentives, this is the way for people to kind of overlook the higher property tax rates you have to pay for homes in Baltimore City versus the county to get them to move into the city? And so, you know, at my administration has worked um, very diligently to reduce the property tax rate. Our track record is very strong, more property tax reduction, I think, the last three uh, administrations almost combined. Uh, but that work can't be, you, you can't just do one thing. You have to look for a comprehensive approach. And in a comprehensive approach, you also look at incentives. We know that we want to get people to take a fresh look at some of our neighborhoods. And incentives have been proven in Baltimore and in other places to, to be that, uh, that, that fresh look that people need to uh, close the deal. And the support that we're getting from the state will help us take advantage of that momentum that already exists. We know that these programs have been successful. We know that uh, it has helped people to make home ownership and actually home ownership where they want to be. A lot of people go to, uh, go, have gone to school in Baltimore. They go to church in Baltimore. The hairdressers in Baltimore, a lot of their families here. Their life is here, but many of them lived outside of the city. These incentive programs, especially coming out of the Great Recession, are giving people the, the boost that they need to cross over the finish line and make home ownership in Baltimore a reality. This doesn't happen without strong collaboration and leadership. So again, I want to thank uh, the Hogan administration and Department of Housing for working so hard to continue to look for ways that we can um, not only make the dream of home ownership a reality, but strengthen our neighborhoods at the same time. So Councilman Pete Welch has this resolution to bring all the stakeholders together to address the issue with dirt bikes. Mm -hmm. He's calling for this conversation on how to build a dirt bike, dirt bike park in Baltimore City. Where are you on this issue? As you know, it's been around for a long time. It, it has been. It's been a challenging issue uh, in Baltimore for years. Uh, I don't even, I, I can't remember even when it started. It's been going, uh, the dirt bike culture has been going on uh, for so long. Um, I think in you know some years we get through the year without uh, the the dirt bike culture and the you know the the um, the impact of communities you know having real clashes. But this year it's been a challenge. We've I think already lost one person to a dirt bike accident. A, a child was critically injured uh, by a dirt bike. And uh, the rather than just having people that um, you know, maybe even um, boisterous, but um, not combative, you know, which we've had for a while. Uh, the, sun, the past Sunday, it, it, the uh, dirt bike gathering turned into a fight among uh, the uh, participants. So it, it certainly uh, raised a concern for me. And I know that um, we've done outreach to some in that community to see if there's a way for us to sit down and look for some solutions. Um, you know, I, I get it uh, that, that um, you know, there are things that are going to exist um, whether, or not the, whether or not there are laws uh, to, to um, make them illegal or not. And I'm sure we could think of all kinds of things that, that uh, fit that bill. Um, so I'm looking for some real, real world solutions and I'm going to be looking to them to help us come up with some real world solutions. The, the challenge with the dirt bike park, and I've spoken to many people about this, is that um, we ha there's, there are no guarantees that if we build this park, you know, it's not one of those things, if you build it, they will come. Um, because, uh, you know, the, just like I said, there's no way to, to say that the, the 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 thrill of uh, of riding, you know, up and down, um, you know, Druid Hill or Arkansas or uh, Rice's Town is not, may or may not be the same as riding in a dirt bike park. And we could spend a lot of time 
uh, developing plans and spend you know taxpayers money developing a dirt bike park and the problem still remain that's why I'm going to be talking um, with the uh, some of the organizers or some of the, the participants and, and, and ask them have a frank conversation and see if we can come up with some real-world solutions what do you think changed uh, this past Sunday because I've been out there and they're hot dog there was a fight a that, violent fight that was it because they're when usually, they first reported it, mm -hmm. they said that it was just a complaint about dirt bikes. And I, I remember going home from work one day four years ago, and they were hot dogging it up right through town road around that park circle area. Yeah, so the, the uh, information I had was the police responded not to dirt bikes, but to a fight between participants. I heard a suggestion um, on the radio, I forget who it was, it might have been C4, that um, not just not build a park, but let uh, the dirt bikes have the highway to nowhere on Sundays and block, and block it off. Are we, is there any is there any thoughts about I mean, blocking know. off certain stretches of the roads instead of build, spending all this money on a new right. park, blocking off some areas to let them let them go at it? This is what I'm saying. This I want to try to come up with some real world solutions. But you have to understand that for every every suggestion like that, it's it does not come without cost, because you know how dangerous the the dirt bike riding is, and by uh, you know if we say yeah let's close down the the uh, highway to nowhere and let um, you know people can do whatever the heck they want to on it on Sundays, what happens when there's an accident? You know, are we is the city now a, a participant? in that so um yeah i don't think that there i think there are a lot of great sounding ideas um i think the the solutions are much more difficult uh to reach uh, that being said i'm i'm looking forward to sitting down with the organizers and trying to see if there's a way that we can um, come to some resolution do you know you guys, who are you guys dealing with in the dirt bike community um i can't give you names just yet okay. But we're we're trying to re we we are reaching out to some of the organizers through some of our grassroots contacts. Can I switch it up? Sure. Adam, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, the board of estimates voted on three settlements mm -hmm. following the police for two hundred eight thousand dollars today. I mean, I mean, does it anger you to have to vote for that amount of money for for police settlements? It angers me uh, that you know that we have to spend uh, taxpayers' money in that way. Uh, but that anger didn't, it didn't stop with the anger, it, 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 it led to action. And I've been very focused on improving uh, the police force, reforming the police force, and that's why the number of lawsuits against uh, the uh, department, against the city under my administration continues to trend down. Uh, we will, you know, every year there will be police settlements on the, uh, on, on the board of estimates. The, the challenge is when you uh, focus on the settlement and not the trends, that you don't get the whole story. And I am uh, very focused on reforming the department and the fact that we've seen reductions in police brutality complaints, excessive force complaints, and the number of lawsuits proves that out. Uh, the, the challenge is, you know, when, there's, when you don't have a complaint, you also don't have a story. Uh, so my, my goal in talking about this is to say that it didn't just anger me, it inspired me to, to work hard to improve the department, and that's the tough work that we're doing. What is it? So in one of the cases where there's you know, questions of a proper search or there's question of a police officer firing his gun through a windshield, you kind of see these as isolated incidents rather than a trend of bad training or police officers not adhering to their training. So every time we have an incident, um, I've instructed the department and the law department to look for ways that the department can grow from that incident so we don't have the same thing happen again. Uh, we've worked to use the, the, um, the this statement of uh, charges or the statement of facts surrounding uh, these incidents when we have lawsuits against the city and as we have to uh, improve training and uh, to make sure that our officers have a very clear understanding of uh, you know what, you know that what their role is, what it's not, and that's why the number of suits are continuing to trend down. So, yeah, every time you see a, a settlement, you know it, it's alarming, 
but you can't just be alarmed, you have to do something about it. And we've been doing the tough work, and a lot of it is behind the scenes, to make sure that we have a better prepared, uh, uh, better prepared department and a department that learns from its mistakes. Well, there was a suggestion from President Young to, instead of using the city coffers, use the police department budget. You didn't, you were, you didn't like that idea, from what I understand. Um, you know, I, I would um, challenge your editorial version of that conversation. Um, you know, we had a conversation, and I told him I was open to discuss it. Can we talk about uh, what I heard? Fallout from the post. Did the post you heard me say that I was willing to discuss it, right? You didn't say that. Um, you uh, there was some back and forth. But it was an explanation about it was putting flesh on the bones of, of his his uh, proposal. It wasn't it wasn't whether I liked it or not. I I said that you well, know. Do you like the idea? I'm open to discuss it. We, it was the beginnings of a conversation about how we can uh, Im improve the accountability of the police department. And with respect to having that conversation, I'm always open to it. But do you like the idea? I think that his idea has some challenges because Where when, are the you, challenges? when you, when you, his suggestion was for it to come out, and it's all city money, but it would come out of the police budget instead of uh, general funds. The challenges, and just like I talked about the, the settlements that we have, we're talking about settlements for things that happened years ago. Uh, the, the, the challenge is if we could go back in time and have it come out of the 2012 budget, it might change behavior. But because of the work that we've done, behavior is changing. So what his suggestion is doing is saying that the 2015-16 police department will pay for the mistakes of 2012. And if you are trying to change behavior, I don't know how you can, um, if, if you can hold this current department responsible for those things and think that you're going to see change. So aren't a number of the officers that involve the case, these cases, aren't they still with the department? And because they're still on the department, in the de many of them are, and because of the, the, the work that we've done, that's why you've seen a reduction in the number of lawsuits against the city, and you've seen uh, a steady increase in the conviction rate for officers that have been found uh, who are accused of wrongdoing. That work, we didn't uh, put push pause in 2012 and not work to reform the police department. We did absolutely the opposite and worked very aggressively to improve training, to push for reforms, and we're seeing a difference. So the challenge is to react in a way that punishes this department that has made the improvements for what happened in 2012. So, you're, so in essence, you're saying don't punish the sons for the sins of the fathers type thing? I mean, you can call it what you want. I just don't I think. I what you want to call it. I've, I've explained it. I don't know if you know it needs a, a motto. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm not looking for a motto. I just want to know how you could. Uh, one more guys. One sentence on it. <laughs> can I ask about the what may happen after this Monday red line meeting that, that we just saw? Um, the, the Hogan administration said they were hoping to hear some suggestions uh, or feedback from um, city officials and, and the, the, the delegations, um, elected officials. Will your administration be submitting any recommendations for transit improvement projects to the DOT? I'm very hopeful that uh, when they say that when the Hogan, administ um, Hogan administration says that they're looking for feedback, that it won't be limited to a piece of paper that has what their job is anyway. Um, I am hoping that uh, the the vision for public transportation. Uh, coming out of the Hogan administration will be bigger than making the buses run on time. That's a conversation that I'm hoping that we will be able to have. The red line was, was a mass transit uh, project that uh, brought improved transportation, it brought jobs, and it also brought economic development. That's how you keep Maryland open for business and Baltimore open for business. My hope is that the next time we sit down and talk, we're talking about a plan that does that, that creates opportunity, not just a plan to uh, improve the, to, to, and I can't even say improve, I mean, it just to, the, the suggestions that we saw are what the MTA is supposed to be doing uh, when it comes to um, bus transportation. So 
again, um, I'm, I remain optimistic that those conversations are possible. Are you working on maybe a, a big idea to pitch to them since they haven't come up with any big ideas? You know, I, I think there are a lot of great uh, transportation officials that have worked over the past uh, 13 years, uh, and certainly over two, you know, a Republican administration and a Democratic administration to come up with the plan for the red line. A lot of those people are still there. I know that they have some ideas. I know that there were some, there were alternatives that to uh, the red line that were discussed. My hope is that we'll be able to revisit some of those um, very well thought out and and. Uh, those collaborative um, options that have been put on the table. This is my last follow-up to this, I promise. Uh -huh. There's been some back and forth on the, the money, mm -hmm. how much money may or may not be available in, in the DOT budget. What does that do as we try to plan going forward for improving city transit? It's a challenge. Um, it, it's a challenge to me uh, when, when uh, constituents ask me what happened with the red line, what's next. Um, it, it is a challenging position to be in uh, for my answer to say, we want you to come back to the table to come up with some uh, new ideas moving forward, even though the state has yet to commit a dollar for it. I mean, those are conversations that I don't know, I don't, I don't know if that invitation would motivate many to come to the table in the spirit of collaboration. I think um, if we heard from the state that we want to work toward your solutions and there's a commitment to fund those solutions, that's a different conversation. Because when we asked people to come to the table for the past 13 years to work on the red line, there was a clear understanding that there was a financial commitment to make those projects happen. That's what we don't have today. And I think that uh, without that commitment, it will be difficult to get the level of collaboration that we need to ensure that the, the plans coming out of whatever's next uh, will be meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. Keep